Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have Alex Smith from MIT uh, speaking today about Selma groups and castle state pairing for finite Galois modules. Okay, yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you, Avishek, for inviting me. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about a tool that I've been developing with Adam Morgan uh, as an outgrowth of something that I needed uh, for some of my arithmetic statistical work. And as part of that, I came up with these distributions on class groups and on uh, summer groups. So for summer groups, how does the four summer group behave was sort of the question I was answering. And I was able to answer it because I had a decent understanding of how the castle state pairing behaved in certain contexts. Um, so this has been something, the castle state pairing is something I've been thinking about for a very long time. Um, but I think, yeah, as a concept, it's been somewhat uh, underdeveloped, uh, like we know that it exists for abelian varieties, that's Tate's original result, uh, building off of castles, and then we have flux result, that you can also define it at the setting of mo motives, uh, or more generally from divisible modules. Uh, but really, I think that the castles state pairing can be defined in such a way that it stands as sort of a general purpose result, something that any time you should use Plato, can use Plato take duality, you can use instead. Um, but uh, before I get into that, uh, let me just talk about sort of the classical framework for understanding the castle state pairing uh, as defined by castles and then Tate. Uh, and the two uh, pieces of background that I need to go through are group cohomology for discrete modules and uh, just some primers on global and local fields. So. For group cohomology, we're just going, we're going to start with a topological group G, um, and we're going to look at discrete G modules. In this context, uh, we define a group cohomology theory um, by taking HIGM to be the set of uh, co-cycles modular co-boundaries. So both co-cycles and co-boundaries are types of co-chains, which are simply um, I airy maps from copies of G to M. Um, co-cycles have to obey a co-cycle condition. In the case of I equals one, this condition is the crossed homomorphism condition, which I've put here. Um, and then co-chains are certain kinds of co-cycles. Uh, now, the crossed homomorphism condition is called that because it looks like just a condition that describes a homomorphism, but with this extra sigma here. So it encodes the group structure, the group action in some way. Um, and in particular, if M has a trivial G action, we just, we notice that H1 GM is a set of continuous homomorphisms from G to M. Uh, so if you haven't thought about group cohomology before, I recommend every time I use the term H1, just think about continuous homomorphisms from the group G to M. Uh, now, uh, H not GM is also very simply to, simple to describe. It's simply the set of M that are invariant under G. And you can, in fact, define HIGM as a derived function using derived functors uh, from this H naught. Uh, and we get a long exact sequence, as we always do. And this is crucial to understanding Selmer groups and, uh, yeah, understanding Selmer groups. Okay, so that's the cohomology we need. Um, on the field side, we're going to set a global field F, um, which is either going to be a number field or a of uh, finite extension of FPT. And FS is going to be a separable closure. We'll use this notation for absolute gala groups. And then we have all the completions. Uh, now, the nice geometric way to think about this would be to define everything in terms of atoll cohomology. Um, and then I wouldn't need to fix all these embeddings. But uh, there are certainly advantages to uh, sticking with this sort of discrete module notation. Uh, and in order for that to work, we have to fix embeddings from our separable extent, separable closure of F into our separable closures of the completions, uh, which is the same thing as choosing a prime in the ring of integers of Fs um, over the prime of V. Uh, and this defines an embedding of the decomposition group at V into GF. Okay, so now with that notation set up, I can give the first example 
of a Selmer group, and this is normally called a Shafarevich state group. Uh, this corresponds to the Selmer group with zero local conditions. So given a GF module M, um, the Shafarevich state group is the set of global one co-cycle classes uh, that vanish locally everywhere. Um, so there's two ways to think about this. Either we can think of it as, yeah, co-cycle classes that everywhere locally look like co-boundaries, um, or we can use the atoll picture. We can think of uh, M as being a, an atoll sheaf over the spectrum of F. Um, and in this case, uh, this is the set of classes inside the atoll uh, cohomology group of M that vanish under pullback everywhere. Um, Okay, and so again, one advantage to this picture is that you don't have to choose all these inclusions. Um, one disadvantage is that it's a little harder to compute with, I think. Um, but if you're more geometrically minded than me, perhaps this is how you'd like to think about it. Okay, great. Uh, now, I called this a summer group, but that was sort of a silly thing to do because the real summer group is defined not on uh, gigantic modules M, but on sort of submodules that we care about. So the key example of this is uh, starts with an abelian variety A. Um, and we can look at the N torsion of this. Um, and by modding out by N torsion, we get these short exact sequences, A N to A to A. Um, and thinking of A as a GF module, uh, we can then take the long exact sequence associated to this. Um, which gives us this five term thing. Um, now, these maps are both just multiplication by n. Uh, and h not gfa, remember, is just the set of invariant points of a under gf, which is the same thing as the f rational points of a. Uh, so on this left, the co kernel of this is just the n, n co torsion uh, of af. And on the right, we have the n torsion of a, a1 GFA. Uh, so we get this short exact sequence. Um, now, this is a very important short exact sequence um, because it involves an object that we really care about in number theory, well, that I care about. I'm, I imagine there's a number theorist in the audience who maybe doesn't care about the Mordell Vey group of an abelian variety, uh, but in general, I think it's a pretty popular object. Uh, and it's a very mysterious object. It's something that we don't really have a good way of computing. And all the ways we do have for computing it, we haven't proved that they work. Uh, so it's mysterious and it's interesting. Um, meanwhile, this middle thing is just a set of homomorphisms, essentially. Uh, so we have this interesting object embedding in a very simple object. Um, currently, the sequence isn't quite suitable for our uses because this middle object's infinite. It doesn't really tell us anything about this. Um, and the way that we deal with this is we start to take, cons we consider local conditions. Uh, so specifically, if we just localize the sequence at V, or I should say complete, so it's at over F V instead of F, uh, we get this commutative diagram. And we see that the image of delta everywhere is going to map into the image of delta V. Uh, so if we define the n Selmer group as the portion of H1 GFA n that maps into the image of delta V everywhere, um, then we have an exact sequence taking this cotorsion into the n Selmer group of A and mapping that to the n torsion of Shaw. And this sequence is much better because this group and this group are both always finite. Uh, and so the way we can think about this is we have a simple object in the middle, a nice finite object. We have a mysterious object we care about on the left. And so as a result, we also care about the object on the right. We now care about the shafarevich tate group, uh, if we didn't before. Uh, and so what can we say about this? This is a really important question to understanding the number theory of abelian varieties. Um, but even today, this object remains very mysterious. So here's a very open conjecture, about as hard as the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture, in my opinion. Uh, it's just that the Schaffer H take root of A is always finite. And this is very, very open. Okay. Now, uh, what we can say is if we 
divide out by the divisible elements and consider the p primary part, we are left with something finite. Um, and what we uh, and so another conjecture would say that uh, that people noticed in the, I think the 40s and 50s is that for elliptic curves, Sha appeared to always have square order. And so uh, in the context of a world where we don't know that Sha is always finite, this means that the P primary parts of Sha modulo its divisible piece should always have square order. Um, this is no longer a conjecture. This was proved back in 1962 by Castles. Uh, and Castle's proof is the starting point for uh, what I'm talking, talking about today, because the way he did it is he constructed a pairing between Sha of A and itself, uh, which was alternating and whose uh, kernel was equal to the divisible portion of Sha of A. And so these two things together gives uh, this result that the P primary parts have square order. Uh, you should think of this as an analog of the fact that a alternating matrix always has even rank in the context of vector fields. Um, so yeah, just basic algebra allows us to go from the fact that this alternating pairing exists uh, to the fact that uh, Sha of A modulus divisible part has square order. And I think it's fair to say that for a long time, this is why people mostly cared about the Castle's pairing was because it would be useful for answering parity questions like this. Um, less useful for answering these questions was Tate's pairing. So uh, what Tate figured out was that if you do the same thing, you start with an abelian variety, but in this case, you start with an abelian variety over just a general global field. Um, now the pairing isn't going to be between uh, Sha of A and itself. It's instead between Sha of A and Sha of A dual. Um, and we also have this restriction to be away from the characteristic of F. It is possible to define the pairing at the characteristic of F. And this is also something I've been working on with Adam Morgan. Um, but uh, yeah, this wasn't part of Tate's original pairing. But yeah, Tate showed now that there was a bilinear pairing between Sha of A and Sha of A dual. Uh, whose kernels were the divisible parts of these groups. Okay, cool. Now I'll get back to the sort of alternating question later in the talk. That's actually very important. Uh, I think for A, caring about the castle state pairing and B, it's also comes up a lot in my work. Uh, but for now, I just wanna recontextualize the castle state pairing, which I think almost everybody thinks about in this form where it's Sha of A and then Sha of A dual or in the case of an elliptic curve, Sha of A and Sha of A. I don't think that this is the best way to frame the castle state pairing, the most useful way. Um, rather, I really prefer thinking about the castle state pairing as a pairing on Selmer groups. So how this works is very, very simple. Um, we have these projections from the N Selmer group of A and the B Selmer group of its dual uh, to Sha of A and Sha of A dual. Um, this just comes from the first exact sequence we have about it, this guy. Uh, and so we can just restrict the castle state pairing then to act or be between summer group of N A and the summer group of A dual like this. Now, uh, we cared about the castle state pairing because its kernels were interesting or maybe it's non-degeneracy, I guess you could say is interesting. Um, and so if the kernels of this weren't interesting, it, this wouldn't be an interesting thing to do, but the kernels are interesting. Now this pairing won't tell us like what the divisible portion is. It doesn't have enough information to do that, but it will tell us the por what portion of the N-Selmer group of A comes from the N-B-Selmer group and what portion of the B-Selmer group of A dual comes from the N-B-Selmer group of A dual. Um, furthermore, uh, this castle state pairing, uh, the castle state pairing in this context can actually be defined just from the Galois structure of the exact sequence taking the B torsion into the NB torsion um, together with the local conditions on these three modules. Um, so we have a pairing that measures the ability to lift something from the Selmer group of the N torsion of A to the NB torsion of A. And so the question I wanted to answer was, can, does this work in general? 
And the answer is yes, it really works in general. Um, and then the more interesting question is, uh, do the sort of geometric properties of the castle state pairing work in general? Um, and that's where things get a little more fun. Um, but let's start by talking about the context in which I now consider the castle state pairing as being defined. Uh, so first we need a general notion of a Selmer group. So take F to be a global field and M to be a GF module as before. Uh, and for each place of F, uh, choose a set of local conditions at V. So this is just gonna be some subgroup of H1 GVM. Um, and we're going to put on this relatively strong assumption um, that LV is a set of unramified classes um, at almost all primes. Uh, this particular assumption uh, can be weakened a lot. You can, uh, for example, it suffices to say that uh, the LV contain the set of unramified classes or are contained in, there's like ways to extend this in a way that works really, really well. Um, but this is a nice simplification for the purposes now. Um, then the Selmer group of this is just a set of H1 GFM that, van that everywhere locally maps to LV. Okay, so that makes sense. Uh, now, looking at this, what I really wanted is I wanted this to be a functor. Uh, this is sort of the key desire to sort of start the work is I want the Selmer group to act as a functor. Um, after all, Sha is a functor. Sha is a really nice functor. Um, but what's keeping this from being a functor? What's keeping this from being a functor is it has two inputs. Um, and so for it to be a functor, we need to have a category of MLVV. And so that's the first thing we do. We define that category. So take S mod F to be the category of tuples M L V V, uh, just as before. And now we're going to say the morphisms in this category are GF equivariant homomorphisms uh, so that that map the local conditions for M into the local conditions for L for M prime. Now it makes sense that we have to have an equivariant homomorphism underlying this. Uh, but the reason we assume this is because then it actually is a functor because any morphism of F induces a map from the summer group of M to the summer group of M prime. Okay. Okay, so that's nice enough. Um, but of course, if this category didn't have nice structure, this would just be sort of nonsense. Um, but it turns out that this category is actually, it has a lot of structure. It's a very nice category. It's not an abelian category, but it still has a lot of really good structure to use. Um, to start with, it has a dual module or it has a duality functor, I should say. Um, and this is defined uh, using local Tate duality. So the starting point is uh, take MV to be just the Cartier dual of M, uh, which is defined using this. Um, at the level we're dealing with of uh, GF modules. Uh, then local Tate duality gives us a bilinear pairing between H1 GVM and H1 GM VM check. Um, we take orthogonal complements with respect to LV. Uh, and now we have a duality functor. Uh, okay, and this, yeah, this is a contravariant functor and it has all the properties we would want from a duality functor. It defines the additive category with duality. Okay, and furthermore, this is the right notion of duality. And the reason I can say that is I can check what it does on the level of abelian varieties. And for abelian varieties, uh, we know that the end torsion of an abelian variety is naturally isomorphic uh, to the Cartier dual of the end torsion of the original abelian variety. So HX end torsion maps to the Cartier dual. Uh, then for any place of F, uh, we can consider the local conditions both coming from A and coming from A check. And what we find is under this correspondence iota, uh, these two sets of local conditions are precisely orthogonal. And so uh, this, this is how we define the Selmer group in our more abstract language. And we have an isomorphism of objects in S mod F. So, this is a really strong sign that this is a good notion of duality for us. 
Okay. Now, the next thing we want to do is we want to define the castle state pairing. And so, what was the castle state pairing trying to do before? It was trying to answer the question of given a map pi of some kind, when does a summer group in the second thing map to something in the summer group of the first thing? Uh, yeah, so here we're restricting to surjective morphisms. Uh, and so there's a there's three reasons why something in the summer group of this might not lift to something in the summer group of this. Uh, the second and third reasons are both interesting. I will not talk about them. The first reason is very boring, um, and I will mention it. Uh, the first issue is that the image of V in L2V might lie outside the image of LV in L2V. If that happens, there's obviously not going to be a way to lift V. Uh, so this is a, a stupid enough problem that I actually have to change the definition of what I'm caring about to deal with it. Um, and I don't feel too bad about it. So call a diagram in S mod F exact. Uh, if it is exact at the level of GF modules and uh, first off L2V is equal to pi of LV. So we get around this issue. And second off L1V is equal to iota negative one LV. And the reason I assume this is so that the dual to this exact sequence also obeys this condition, which is essential. Okay, so that's the setup. Uh, and now we can define the castle state pairing. So a bit of notation, sometimes we omit the LVV. So here's the theorem. If we have an exact sequence in S mod F, then there is a natural pairing between the summer group of M2 and the summer group of M1 check, uh, whose left kernel is equal to pi of the summer group of M. It is in fact measuring if we can lift something from here to here. Uh, and I am ascribing this result to Tate. Uh, Tate was not operating at this level of generality, um, but his construction of the pairing works just fine here. Uh, and the proof that his left kernel is the same also works just fine. Um, okay, so the interest, first interesting question we can ask then is what is the right kernel of this pairing? Already with this, we have to answer something. Um, and so we bring in the dual exact sequence. Uh, and so when we look at the Castle State pairing for this dual exact sequence, uh, we know from the theorem I just put up that uh, its left kernel inside of the summer group of M1 check, which is the final term of V check, is going to be iota check summer M check. Okay. And so to answer the question I put up before, what was the right kernel of the Castle State pairing for E? It actually turns out to also be iota check summer M check. And this points to something a little deeper that one of the crucial properties of the Castle State pairing, uh, which is if you have an exact sequence in S mod F and you have its dual exact sequence, uh, these M1 check, we have obviously corresponds between these two objects, they're the same. And these two objects are also naturally isomorphic because uh, M2 and M2 check check uh, map to each other under uh, the evaluation isomorphism. And so the theorem is that if you have phi and psi in the summer group of M2 and the summer group of M1 check, uh, the castle state pairing of phi and psi uh, equals the castle state pairing with respect to the dual of psi phi. And so in particular, the right kernel of this pairing, or sorry, of this pairing has to be the left kernel of this pairing, which allows us to come up with this. Don't um, we expect there to be a minus sign? Why do we expect there to be a minus sign? <laughs> because if we've got an elliptic curve, which is self-dual, then we, we want the capital state pairing to be alternating. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a really good point. And these calculations are hard enough that for, I think a couple weeks early on, I had a minus sign in this identity. Um, but then like I kept running into problems somewhere else and I was like, what? What is happening? Um, and the answer to your question is that minus sign comes from something else. Uh, and we will get to that. 
So. Okay. But, okay. Yeah, this actually is a symmetry. Uh, but yeah, as Evan pointed out, uh, the castle state pairing is usually thought of as something that is anti-symmetric. Uh, but the reason is, the reason that underlies the anti-symmetry results of the past is this uh, result here. Um, so you can think of this as a symmetry result, as an anti-symmetry result. Uh, the cool thing about this is it actually doesn't care. It, it, you don't need uh, some extra structure on any of the Gala modules going in to get a result like this. Okay, and just to end the section, here is what the castle state pair lo pairing looks like if you think of it as a sneaky thing. Um, it takes the Selmer group of M2 to the Pontryagin doodle of the Selmer group of M1 check. Um, and you might look at this and think, huh, that makes the castle state pairing of E look like a connecting map in some kind of cohomology theory. Um, and it is, it very much is, um, but it is in a flat cohomology theory with a lot of cones. Um, so I think that is a little bit harder to think of it in those terms, which is why I'm not in this talk. Uh, but again, further work with Adam uh, will sort of help elucidate this. Okay, now again, uh, the value of thinking about the castle state pairing uh, in this way depends very much on the properties we can show for it. Um, and the big one is this. It is naturality, and here's how it works. We have a uh, sequence EA mapping to EB, and we have phi in the summer group of M2A and psi in the summer group of M1B check. Okay, there are two ways to take the castle state pairing of these two elements. First, you can map phi along F2 and take the castle state pairing with respect to the second sequence. Alternatively, you can take the dual of F1 this maps from M1B check to M1A check. And then Psi under this will give you something in M1A check, and you can take the castle state pairing up here. Um, and it's actually very straightforward to prove from the definition that the castle state pairing does not care which of these you choose. Uh, you can compute the castle state pairing of these elements either with respect to EA or with respect to EB. Uh, and this property is sort of innocuous, but it turns out to be kind of the juice to making studying the category S mod F interesting. As an example of this, let me talk about bare sums. So in any abelian category, you have a way of adding extensions. So here we have two exact sequences with uh, changing middles and the same uh, things on the ends. Uh, what the bare sum is, is it's an operation on such extensions that allows us to add them. So we again get an extension. Um, and this operation is, uh, it can be defined categorically, like for just in terms of limits and columns. Uh, and it is an abelian operation. It turns the set of extensions into an abelian group. If you want to think of it in terms of X1, it is the abelian operation on X1. Um, and just as an example, uh, here we have the cyclic group of order 16, broken up into cyclic four, cyclic four. Uh, that's straightforward enough. You can add it to itself. You get this horrible thing. Uh, this I consider to be the first really weird exact sequence. It's the simplest exact sequence that I don't like looking at because it confuses me. Um, but yeah, one way of choosing it. <laughs> One way of choosing it, or of defining it, is as a bare sum of this sequence with itself. Uh, now, again, normally this is defined in an abelian category, but an S mod F is not an abelian category. Um, monic, epic, non-isomorphisms exist in this category. Um, despite this, S mod F still has bare sums. Um, it, it is a quasi-abelian category, which means uh, technically that you can pull back exact sequences and get other exact sequences. And you can also push forward exact sequences and get exact sequences. And so in particular, in such categories, bare sums are well-defined. Um, and naturality, one of, its main con one of its consequences is this nice proposition. If you have two extensions, you can add them together 
Um, and uh, the Castle State pairing for that equals the sum of the individual Castle State pairings. Um, as a slogan, you can say that this means that the Castle State pairing is trilinear. Um, so it depends linearly on phi, on psi, and on the extension class E. Um, yeah, and so uh, this actually was an observation that both Adam and I made a long time ago, um, but we didn't realize we were talking about bare sums. It comes up in the context of uh, dealing with the Castle's tape pairing on two summer groups for quadratic twists. Um, because in that context, this sum actually is much simpler than either this or this, so it's far easier to control. And so, uh, yeah, you can figure out statistical properties of the castle state pairing just from bare sums, um, which is very nice. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's one example of naturality really being used pretty well. Um, one example of it showing why we might care about this category. Um, here's another, um, or yeah, here's sort of, I, I think the main one. Uh, what happens when we combine naturality with the duality identity? Uh, what happens is we now have two ways to compare the castle state pairing for E with E check. Uh, because if we have phi and psi in the castles in the summer group of M2, then we can uh, use the duality identity to switch the order of phi and psi uh, showing up. So that's what we do here. Um, we get something in E check. Uh, but now uh, we have naturality to go from this exact sequence to this. And so castle state pairing of E of phi and f2 psi uh, equals castle state pairing over E again of psi and f1 check phi. And so if f check equals f, this gives us symmetry. This gives us just straight symmetry. Um, so if the central column equals itself dual, the castle state pairing is not anti-symmetric, it is symmetric. Um, and this has applications to class groups. But um, what Evan is now realizing is that it also explains what's happening in the elliptic curve setting. So in that setting, um, if f check is equal to negative f, um, then when you put that into this result here, you get that this is anti-symmetric. Uh, and so what this tells us then, uh, we can now explain uh, the Evans observation from before. If we have a principally polarized abelian variety, um, the vape pairing is an alternating pairing on it um, that lands in FS cross. Um, and so this gives us a, an anti self dual map from AN squared to its dual. And that fits in the central column of a diagram of this form. Since F check is equal to negative F in this context, we immediately get the, the Castle state pairing of the Enselmer group of A with itself for a principally polarized abelian variety is anti symmetric. Um, and now this result is normally ascribed to Tate, uh, and you can certainly prove it from Tate's work. Um, but I think the first good proof of it is probably by Flock, who proved it in a more general setting. So in general, if you have anti-symmetric structure on a Gala module, the Castle State pairing for it is also anti-symmetric. Um, what's interesting then is that there's also a symmetry result that sort of has the same ancestor as this anti-symmetric result. And what I want to talk about for the final part of my talk is, well, what happens when we look at Castle State pairings of things that are symmetric? Oh, I don't want to talk about that yet. I completely blanked on something. Uh, before I get to that, I want to mention a really crucial distinction that came up in work of Bjorn Poonen and Michael Stoll from 1999. And this is the distinction between anti-symmetric pairings and alternating pairings. Uh, so for vector or for um, you know, in characteristic zero situations, these have the same meaning. Alternating or anti-symmetric means that you have a matrix uh, that when you go over the main diagonal, you should get negative of the entry you started with. Uh, so uh, that's pretty simple. Uh, and along the diagonal in characteristic zero, uh, when you go over the diagonal, you should get negative yourself. And so you're stuck being zero. Okay. Um, 
But uh, in the ca case of Q mod C, uh, you, when your pairing is valued in Q mod C, um, anti-symmetric does not necessarily imply that you have zeros along the diagonal uh, because one half is also equal to negative one half. And so you have anti-symmetric pairings that are not alternating. Um, alternating includes this extra assumption that you have zeros along the diagonal. Um, and you'll recall that the castle state pairing for an elliptic curve is alternating. Um, but the castle state pairing here actually turns out to be not necessarily alternating. Um, and an explanation was found for this by Poonin and Sol by using theta groups. So at the most abstract level, a theta group is just a central extension of a Gala module uh, by FS cross, uh, whose commutator pairing is something we care about. Um, so yeah, you know, the commutator pairing here, because this is central, defines an alternating pairing on M, which gives us a map from M to M check. And so the let me understand. Yep. Um, the, um, so for an elliptic curve, the, uh, the they pairing is alternating. And the corresponding uh, pairing on SHA-1 is alternating. You mentioned that early on when you were talking about the order being a square. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, sorry, in what generality is it not necessarily alternating? Uh, so the V pairing is always alternating. Uh, that is true. Yeah. Um, but for even abelian surfaces, I think even over Q, um, uh -huh. you can have non-alternating anti-symmetric castle state pairings. Um, and yeah, uh, Sorry. Uh, yeah. This, is, this was sort so, of a miss, yes. Are you saying that uh, when you were using naturality and duality, if F, is, uh, if F is alternating, then the corresponding castle state pairing is alternating? Or is that not? If what is alternating? If F, the map from M to its dual is alternating. Oh, that, yeah, that's not sufficient because if that were true, then uh, this argument would tell us that the castle state pairing for a principally polarized abelian variety is always alternating. And that's not true. Um, okay, because the they pairing is alternating. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so. Now, it's known from uh, work of Mumford that uh, there are theta groups that explain uh, this pairing here. You can express this as a commutator pairing of a theta group um, in a very natural way. Uh, the theta group is sort of an isomorphism group of uh, the associated line bundles. Um, and so what uh, Poonin and Stoll were able to do was they were able to boil down this uh, theta group uh, for the n torsion of the abelian variety, get a class um, valued in a n check. And what they found was that this element explained uh, the alternatingness or non alternatingness of the castle state pair. Uh, so, yeah, the, the diagonal elements of the castle state pairing were just given by the castle state pairing with this psi theta coming from the theta class. Uh, and in order to prove it, the, the, the proof is like a sentence. It uses the geometric definition of the castle state pairing. It's a sentence. And it's a really good sentence um, because the castle state pair, for a long time, people just didn't notice that the castle state pairing could ever not be alternating for principally polarized abelian varieties. Um, so this was a really, really interesting observation. Um, now, to generalize this, uh, instead of considering the theta groups coming from like Mumford's work, we just have general central extensions. Um, as before, we can define, oops, <laughs> I must not have pressed pre um, print twice. That's too bad. Um, anyhow, uh, we have some notion of when LVV are acceptable for our theta group, uh, given from non-abelian cohomology. Uh, but assuming this is the case, we can define a theta class pretty much as before. Uh, and what we find is that the castle state pairings diagonal elements uh, 
are also given by Castle State Pairing with this theta class. Uh, and since we didn't have geometry, uh, the proof is just a horrifying coaching bash, um, but it does recover the result of Poon and install. Um, and the thing that I want to talk about now is it can be used to prove other theorems that otherwise would be very hard to prove. Um, so, and these theorems come up in class groups. Okay, so we are done talking about abelian varieties and we're done talking about uh, anti-symmetric structure mostly um, because class groups really have symmetric structure. Okay, so starting point, uh, I'm going to put down a result that was recently shown by Salwin, Zimmerman, and uh, Lipnowski. I did that order wrong, Lipnowski, Salwin, and Zimmerman. Uh, and what they found is that if you have a number field containing some roots of unity, um, then you have a symmetry on the class group that yeah, uh, sort of impacts the cohen lenstra heuristics of how the class groups in such a family behave. Uh, so just a bit of notation. Uh, we're going to take chi and alpha to just be the Gawa character associated uh, to the to the Coomer extension uh, f and through alpha, um, and we're going to take rec to be the reciprocity map of Arden. Okay, and now that's enough to state the result. So, if we suppose that f contains mu n squared over d, and we choose ideals i and j of f. Uh, and units alpha and beta uh, subject to these relations. Uh, and if uh, alpha and beta correspond to a unramified everywhere extension, uh, then we have this reciprocity result. Uh, we apply chi alpha to j, and it should equal approximately chi beta of i, um, or rather, yeah, once we take these powers. And yeah. Uh, despite the fact that this is a very basic result, uh, it didn't really appear anywhere for a very long time. Uh, again, this result was came out in a preprint last year, uh, is where you can find this for the first time. And in order to find this result for number fields, uh, people had to consider the function field analog first. The function field had this extra symmetry from a sort of natural geometric structure, uh, and then people went back and said, oh, no. I guess this is true as well, um, which is sort of reverse engineered. Uh, now, from my point of view, uh, this is actually a really good test case for the Castle State pairing, and it sort of shows uh, its strength to yeah, prove results like this. Um, but in order for it to do that, we first need to interpret the pairings that are showing up here in terms of the Castle State pairing. Uh, and in order to do that, we need to think of things as Selmer groups. Um, so first thing that's the Selmer group is the uh, dual class group to F. So uh, I think of this as a set of uh, homomorphisms from the uh, maximal unramified extension of F uh, to Q mod Z, the, the Scala group. Uh, and of course we have a natural reciprocity pairing just given by evaluation. Um, and on n torsion, this restricts to a pairing uh, whose torsion or whose uh, kernel, I should say, is the part that comes from the n squared part, very analogous to our summer groups. Um, and so this is the pairing that I want to be a Castle State pairing. Um, and it is, uh, or it almost is. So specifically, the dual class group, uh, again, just the homomorphisms from Hilbert class field over f to 1 over nz mod z. This is pretty clearly just the set of homomorphisms that everywhere locally are unramified. So it's expressed as a Selmer group. And so the dual thing we should expect then is that the class group of F should be the Selmer group of the dual of this object. So a one over N Z mod Z uh, dual, that would be mu N and then LVV perp. Uh, and that's not quite the case. Uh, because there's extra units in the Selmer group that aren't in the class group, but we do have this short exact sequence. Uh, so the units of F mapping into the Selmer group of mu n, and then you take the kernel and you're left with the n torsion word class group. Uh, so this is, yeah. Okay. Uh, so we have this exact sequence. 
And so now we can state the how the reciprocity pairing is a castle state pairing. Uh, namely, if we have take en to be just the exact sequence decomposing a cyclic group, um, the castle state pairing for en equals the nth order reciprocity pairing between phi and the image of PCL psi in the class group. So now we can go between the two. And now that so we can. when you write cell of mu n, uh, you're implicitly using the dual system of conditions to the unramified one? Yes, yes. Uh, and at most places, these are still the unramified conditions. Um, it's just that the places dividing n where you have some problems. Okay, yeah. So yeah, we want to get this nice symmetry result. Uh, and now we have, we know that we can do it if we can express it for the castle state pairing. Uh, and the thing is for the castle state pairing, the symmetry result, at least in the case D equals one, just falls out. So fix any isomorphism, here's the proposition. Uh, if F contains mu n squared, uh, and we fix an isomorphism one over n z mod z to mu n, um, then the castle state pairing associated to this exact sequence is symmetric. Um, and given the duality identity and naturality, this is basically just saying that we have this morphism of exact sequence. So any isomorphism between the cyclic group of over order n squared and the n squared roots of unity uh, is going to be self-dual, symmetry is free. Um, yeah, so yeah, we got the result for free. Uh, a more interesting question is how do we deal with changing D? Um, and I won't give you the full answer. Um, there are actually a few different ways to do it. Um, one, you can replace this exact sequence with, uh, instead of n, n squared n, maybe a, a, b, b. Um, on the other hand, you can also consider field extensions. So we have a natural way of going from, if we have a field extension k over f, uh, we can go from a summer group in k to a summer group in f uh, using induction. Uh, that works at the level of local conditions and that preserves castle state pairing nicely. Um, Sorry, that was yeah, that was an advanced sentence I just said, uh, but I, I wanted to point out that this stuff all works pretty well with changing fields. Um, but the way that I'm choosing to put up now is you can also use bare sums. So how does the bare sum approach work? Well, let's say we're looking at the specific example. So take n equals four and suppose f contains mu eight. Uh, and we're then what we want to understand is we want to understand twice the castle state pairing associated to E4. So that's from cyclic four to cyclic 16 to cyclic four. Uh, this is a pairing between the force, the summer group of the cyclic group of order four and itself. And we want to prove it's symmetric. Uh, but twice this castle state pairing uh, is equal to the castle state pairing of E4 plus E4. Uh, and if you remember from earlier in the talk, uh, E4 plus E4 in the context of bare sum takes this form, one over four Z mod Z into this, into this. Uh, and in particular, uh, since F contains mu eight, this is a self-dual object over F. And so just as in this case, uh, we can find a yeah, self-dual map from this to its dual um, and that, demonstrates that this pairing is symmetric. Okay, yeah. So that's nice. Uh, and to finish off, uh, so far I've just given new proofs of results by Lipnowski, uh, Saiwan, and Zimmerman, but I wanna mention that theta groups can play a role in this um, and they can tell us new things. Uh, now the theta group can't tell us something directly about this pairing or this pairing, because these pairings are symmetric. Um, but we can define related pairings with anti on anti-symmetric objects if we introduce a complex conjugation into the picture. Now, I won't get into how this works exactly, uh, but I will state the main result. So suppose F is a CM field with complex conjugation containing mu n squared over D. Uh, 
And now, uh, as before, choose an ideal i uh, whose nth power is equal to a principal ideal alpha. Um, and uh, we're also going to assume uh, for simplicity that this extension is split at the primes dividing two. Um, and just to make things work, we need to assume it's everywhere unramified. Um, then chi and alpha of the reciprocity of kappa applied to i uh, has dth power equal to one. Uh, and this is proved with the theta group calculation. Uh, now, again, theta groups aren't like night and day. They're just telling you about uh, the diagonal and whether the terms on it are one half or zero. Um, so it's true that the result we put up before was enough to show that this left-hand side was always either equal to plus one or minus one. Um, but the cool thing about theta groups is, uh, yeah, you can now differentiate between those two cases. You always have an identity like this. And just as an example, uh, the theory is able to handle the case where uh, you don't have completely split conditions above two. Uh, in that case, you don't always get one. You sometimes get minus one, uh, and it just depends, um, yeah, on the count of primes at two that have certain above two that have certain properties uh, with respect to the involved extensions. Okay, great. So that is all I wanted to talk about. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Let's thank uh, Alex. Please unmute yourselves. Questions for Alex? Alex, um, yes. So, how do you anticipate, or, or do you see this helping simplify some of your arguments with statistics from your? your um, you, uh, so that's a good question. Um, the main thing it does for me is um, I had in all, in all my previous statistical papers, I had sort of these cochain calculations for uh, going from oh, the quadratic twist, one quadratic twist to the next, or combining a bunch of quadratic twists. Uh, and uh, all of those calculations turn out to be uh, some application of naturality. So it gives a framework under which my random tricks look like they're supposed to happen, um, which is nice. Uh, I appreciate that about it. Um, but I mean, mostly I developed this tool for technical reasons. So one application of it is, uh, I, I really want to think about class groups of quadratic imaginary fields uh, as Selmer groups. But that's not quite true. Uh, you have to sort of decompose. If you have a quadratic extension k over f, uh, when you look at its class group, uh, it has the portion you care about, which is sort of the portion outside the class group of f, but it also has the class group of f sort of put in. Um, and that's sort of confusing. That makes uh, interpreting uh, the class group as a Selmer group it more challenging. Um, and the for, uh, so I solved this problem. I was able to find a Selmer group inside of the class group and control that and say, OK, then this controls the class group. Um, but then much later on, I realized that the argument I had written down was exactly the same as Milne uses to construct, to prove that the Castle State pairing has uh, the kernels it's supposed to have. It's the same two steps. Um, so I was like, oh, it would be a lot easier if we had done that in all cases. <laughs> uh, so that's one technical case, which was really important for my work. Uh, another one uh, concerns uh, the question of spin of prime ideals. Uh, so the spin of prime ideals it's a is an invariant associated to a prime ideal in a with respect to a given extension k over f again. Um, it was defined by Friedlander, Ivanich, Mazur, and Rubin, and it comes up a lot in calculating, say, two summer groups for abelian varieties that don't have full rational two torsion. Uh, and mostly these spin terms go away when you do your two summer calculation. But the ones that don't, uh, you need to be able to control somehow. Uh, 
But what I was able to find was I was able to control them by using a theta group argument. So that's just another random occurrence of like this theory being useful for my, my stuff. Okay, so that was maybe a more complete answer than I should have given to that question. But uh, yeah, it, it, it has been quite useful for uh, me thinking about my work. Hi, Alex. Uh, you'd also mentioned it was uh, helping you in understanding the four Selma group. Did you mean that in families of twists and why, uh, why does it help with the four Selma group? Uh, yes, yeah, so I meant it absolutely in families of twists. So how that works, uh, I'm just going back to uh, pretty early, uh, specifically this page. So uh, I'm not able to, it, it's um, yeah, in the sort of- E2 and E4 to E2, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So the, the, instead of caring really about the four Selmer group, I care about the two Selmer group and the form of the castle state pairing on it with N and B both equal to two. Uh, which is, yeah, from my point of view, it gives you the same information. It gives you still the rank information. Um, and so what happens is uh, this exact sequence, uh, uh, two torsion into four torsion into two torsion again, uh, is hard to calculate the castle state pairing from. Um, but then if you twist this, <coughs> excuse me, uh, when you twist it, uh, you get a chi of two, uh, which is the same thing as a two on both sides. And then in the middle, you have this uh, simple object. It actually turns out to be just the induced module of a two. Uh, so you take a two, you think of it as a k module if k over f is the quadratic field you're associating with it. Um, the induced module of a two going from k back to f. So it has this really simple gala structure. And so calculating the castle state pairing for that extension is actually much easier. Oh, very cool. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. So this, looking at this slide, I'm reminded that in some of um, Ben Howard's work, early work on um, the Higner point Euler system or Kohli Wagen system, he, he actually has to define a sort of a, a castles tape pairing on summer groups for finite modules to follow mm -hmm. follows Flock. So very similar to this. He does, I mean it's it's still a little more ad hoc. He follows Flock's argument and things like this. But it becomes turns out to be very useful um, in, in his work on on Euler systems where you you don't have lifts of all your classes coming from each one of the, the big big modules or something like that. So yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, it's possible that your framework actually might provide sort of a more a slicker way of, of dealing with some of the things that he does. Yeah, this is this is what I'm hoping. I, I think uh, with a lot of Euler system stuff, um, and then in my area of expertise, Cohen Lenstra stuff, and uh, yeah, just class group stuff in general. Uh, I, I think yeah, this gives you a sort of slick way of doing. Um, stuff that for a lot of Euler system papers, it appears in like section three, uh, like sort of the lemma background material. It, it sort of, it, it makes it feel more natural as opposed to just the necessary uh, work to get to the main point. Um, at least that's what I'm hoping will happen with it. Uh, whether that actually happens, uh, yeah, depends, I guess, on how the paper is received. Uh, yeah, uh, just just as actually as an example, uh, I, I mentioned field change, uh, and field change can be done in a pretty slick way, uh, in a sort of categorical way. Um, but field change actually has appeared in the literature before, but the only source I've found for it is uh, your paper with Urban. You do this, uh, or your paper with Urban, excuse me, um, your paper on about the GL two Euler system, uh, or yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I forget the title, but... Uh, so do yeah. I, don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, but early on, you have sort of this correspondence between uh, Selmer groups over K and Selmer groups over F. Uh, 
And so, yeah, I'm hoping that like just having like sort of a codified source for this uh, will be helpful in such calculations going forward. Yes, yeah, it would be a nice complement to what uh, like Nekovar did with his Selmer complexes in terms of packaging all the big Galois representations. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So for those who, yeah, uh, Nekovar produced a, uh, a a volume of asterisk uh, that generalized castle state pairings, or or sorry, not castle state pairing. He he did generalize that, but he. Uh, generalize the notion of a Selmer group from being entirely in H1 to, I think, being mixed between some th things, but mostly it was going from uh, Galois modules to uh, complexes considered, I think, in the derived category. Uh, now, he, I've always been a little salty at this book because um, it was written you know, 14 years ago and it says Selmer groups are dead, long live Selmer complexes. And I, so I came of age studying exclusively the dead thing. Um, but yeah, so many complexes are very interesting and it is, uh, he does have sort of the analogous higher order theory, whereas this is sort of going down in complexity. Do you have a generalization of the spin, which has a, quite an interesting function in terms of uh, prime number theory, which is why Ivanich and Friedland are on there. Is there a generalization of that quantity, which is not multiplicative and hence got the kind of cancellation that they showed? You know what I mean, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so spin has been generalized a lot since uh, Ivanich's, uh, since that paper, Friedland, Friedland, Fitchmaser, Rubin. Uh, and almost nothing is known about it, um, really, because most of the conjecture is about spin uh, boiled down to harder conjectures about short character sums, mm -hmm. uh, Burgess bound stuff. And I'm not um, worried. I, I'm not concerned about any proofs. I'm just wondering whether your new algebraic setup here introduces other kind of functions. So what's interesting about a, a function on the integers, which is not multiplicative is you can sometimes get cancellation in it precisely because it's twisted multiplicative. Uh, as opposed to if you have a character, you would be facing the Riemann hypothesis. So yeah, I'm wondering if they are natural functions. I don't, not, not proving anything about it, but just with a, because that came out naturally and it'd be nice if there was kind of a understanding of where that came from. And and given that you're thinking generally, I, that was my question. Not, not yeah, really. absolutely. Um, so I have thought about spin in a very general context. Um, like uh, almost everything in FIMR can be generalized pretty much without consequence. So instead of considering a cyclic extension, it's fine to consider just a Galois extension, K over F. Um, and then instead of considering uh, principal ideals, it's fine to consider like uh, just regular, any sort of prime ideal. Um, and because then the resulting spin term is pretty much well-defined up to something you can calculate from a Frobenius. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a, that's a level of generality that I'm dealing with just uh, any Galois extension, any prime ideal of F and uh, any uh, sigma from your Galois extension to define. Uh, that's That all works fine. Um, and yeah, you can also multiply them together, but I don't, I wish I had thought a little bit further about sort of the analytic theory of these. Um, I think it, for me, it's still very mysterious. Um, I, I would love to see more examples of cases where uh, we could actually prove that the spin is equidistributed. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But that, yeah, I have, I have no idea. Yeah, thanks. If there are no further questions, let's thank Alex again.